Yes. And Abdur Rahman, you see, this shows that it's a wonderful relationship, and they're really in love with him. This is this is this is what this <laughs> I, this is what this prophet does to you, ladies and gentlemen. We have to before you go on, because you talked about slaves. Mm -hmm. I gotta mention how many slaves Muhammad gave up for Safiya. I gotta mention that, Dave. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay, guys, this is you. You thought first, this first, was first, disgusting? first. Who's Saf but, yeah. who's Sophia, and how did Muhammad end up with her? Yeah, because uh, Muhammad and what did was he known? do? And what did he do to her husband? Oh yeah, this is at Khaybar. Her husband, the Jew, was tortured. You know, a fire set on his chest, right? Because he knew the whereabouts of the treasures of Khaybar, and they tortured him to confess where it is, and then killed him and beheaded him. Now, this is his wife. The sources say she's around 17 years old. Her name is Safiya. Safiya, guys. Now, I'm going to read two narrations because there are Muslims who tell you, and when I hear this, I don't know, to laugh, cry. They'll tell you, you see, Muhammad's marriages were political in nature. It shows his mercy. One of the reasons why he was marrying these women to cement relationships with other tribes. It was for political Unity, David. It wasn't because they were beautiful and he lusted for them. It's only a sick mind like yours that would think that. Okay. Now I'm going to read two narrations. You're going to see that number one, Safiya was taken by one of the jihadis, companion of Muhammad named Dihya ibn Kalbi. He took her because Muhammad said to him, go and take any slave girl you want. Someone told Muhammad about her status, about her possession and beauty. So then he told Dia, come here, man. No, 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 that's not for you. She's for me. So I'm going to pick it up in midstream. It's Sal Bukhari, volume one, number 367. Sal Bukhari, volume one, number 367. So he says, <clears throat> here again, I'm going to pick it up where they're talking about captives. Dihya came and said, Dihya came and said, Oh, Allah's prophet, give me a slave girl from the captives so I can play patty cake with her. Give me a slave girl from the captives. The Prophet said, go and take any slave girl. He took Safiya bint Huye. Huye. A man came to the Prophet and said, O oh, Allah's Apostle, you gave Safiya bint Huye to Dihya, and she is the chief mistress of the tribes of Qurayza and Nadir, and she befits none but you. So the Prophet said, bring him along with her. So Dihya came with her, and when the Prophet saw her, he said to Dihya, Take any slave girl other than her from the captives. Anas added, the prophet then manumitted her, set her free, and married her. Now, this other narration, notice what he did. This comes from Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan Abu Dawood, volume 2, right, page 848 in the English translation. And the subheading is, volume 2, book 13, Kitab al-Kharaj, book of tribute, spoils, and rulership, chapter 1109 on the special portion of the Prophet taken exclusively by him from the booty. The about now, Safiya. Anas said, a beautiful slave girl. So not only is she a chief mistress, she's beautiful. A beautiful slave girl fell to Dihya. The apostle purchased her for seven slaves. He then gave her to Umm Sulaim for decorating her and preparing her for marriage. Okay, now notice the narrator, Hamad said, Safiya, daughter of Huye, should pass her waiting period to in, into her home. Now, two things. Why did Muhammad want her? Beautiful chief mistress. And what did Muhammad give to take her from Dihya? Seven slaves. So let me ask you a question, David. I'm told Muhammad came to liberate women exalt their status, and that Islam is against slavery. Can you explain to me why Muhammad had seven slaves to begin with that he could give for Safiya? And why did Muhammad take Safiya when the traditions say she was beautiful and the chief mistress when people like Jamal Badami tells me that's not the reason why Muhammad slept with women and married them? Can you help me understand? Yeah, what, what's interesting in all this is when Muslims, uh, Muslim apologists and scholars, they they invent some good motive, right? <laughs> like <laughs> with uh, and, and, you know, the inventing the motive goes back to Allah and Muhammad himself. So, for instance, when Muhammad starts lusting after Zainab, 
Allah has to sort of put his stamp of approval on it by saying, oh, you did this because you need to, men around the world need an example that it's okay to marry the divorced wives of their own adopted sons, right? When in reality, Muhammad just started lusting after this extremely beautiful woman, right? But when, and this goes, again, this goes back to the time of Muhammad, when people take these scenarios and they have to invent a good motivation for Muhammad, it's as if they're admitting that Muhammad's actual motivation makes him a sicko pervert, and so they can't accept it, right? That if, if, if Muhammad's sleeping with a slave girl because he sees a slave girl walking around, he's like, whoa, I got the hops for her. Oh, Hafs is out at the market. Oh, let me jump on that in Hafs' bed. Um, if Muhammad's doing all of this, then uh, it, it, it's like the Muslim scholars and apologists understand how messed up this dude, and they just have to keep inventing yeah. things to yeah. make him look good. And here's the other thing they have to do. They have to try and find something... <laughs> to make him look good by comparison. So here's Abdul Rahman Muhammad again. King Solomon, I think, had a thousand vies. These? Uh, yeah. The Christian church says no, one wife. Why do you forbid what God made lawful? Now, Sam, a couple things here. Yeah. Uh, do Has anyone ever put forward Solomon as the pattern of conduct for, for the world? Absolutely not. He's the pattern of what not to do. Yeah, so wait a minute. When we look to King Solomon, do we say, well, Solomon did it, therefore we all need to do it? Or do do we think of Solomon as a sinner? And and notice Abdul Rahman here says, oh, the Christian church says no, like we're going against the Bible. The Bible is putting him forward as a model of good conduct and saying, hey, Solomon did it, and therefore you guys should do it too. Um, are we going against the Bible, or does the Bible itself think that Solomon was wrong on this? If you guys go to 1 Kings chapter 11, just read the chapter. It says Solomon took 700 wives, 300 concubines, foreign women, and he worshipped their gods and sacrificed to them. This violated what God said the king can and cannot do. So read 1 Kings 11, cross-reference that. I'm giving you the cross-references. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. In Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, God tells Moses when they enter the land, they're going to ask for a king. The king's going to have to be from their brothers, and here are the do's and don'ts. And it even says in Deuteronomy 17, 17. Deuteronomy What's, it 17 What's it say? It says, it says, the king cannot multiply wives lest his heart turns away. So let me get this straight, Sam. We're talking about Muhammad here. And notice, we're, we're, in, in the context here, we're not even talking about, we're not really talking about simply polygamy, right? We haven't, we haven't, we haven't, I mean, we could talk about the psychological impact it would have um, on a on a woman and so on, but the bulk of what we're saying here, the bulk of what we're saying here is one. Muhammad gets all these wives. He does not treat treat them equally. He starts showing special privileges. Uh, they're they have they're of varying degrees of attractiveness to him, and the least attractive one he wants to kick to the curb. Um, yeah. So we're pointing out all these things, and then the you know the sex slaves and but Muhammad received revelation saying you can have four. You can have up to four wives. He had at least nine wives at one time. Why? Because he's getting special revelations, just like Aisha says. Anytime he wants something, his Lord hastens to satisfy his desires. This all looks extremely, extremely suspicious. We point out all of this, and this is the pattern of conduct for, for people around the world of all times. And then the response, but... You hypocrites! What about King Solomon? And King Solomon, by having a thousand wives, was violating the commands of the Almighty. Now notice, if, if, if Solomon were like Muhammad, he would just say, I just received a revelation! Oh my, I got a revelation! The Almighty has told me to take a thousand wives! And that he has abrogated that earlier command! Oh! That's what he would have done, right? That's what he would have done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the Bible, the Bible just doesn't let people get a, get away with this, and so God so uh, Abdul Rahman, how is this a response? How is this a response? How do you respond to your prophet being one of the most disgusting pigs? Who's that's yeah. the only that's the only way. When you talk about a man who's like this, no you call him a pig, right? No disrespect to pigs, right? He's a disgusting pig, and you're. But what about Solomon? Yeah. 
He's yeah. not our pattern yeah. of conduct, dude. He was a, Solomon was a sinner. Solomon is a sinner and now serves as a warning to the rest of 100%. us. Your prophet and is still put to, put forward as the example for mankind. And he's still, his followers, his apologists are still out there lying. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's, it's so beautiful. The, the, the relationships he had, it was so perfect. Oh, all his wives, they loved him so much because he was so fair and equal to all of them and they knew they could trust him. Dude, why do you guys have to constantly, this why he's such a disgusting pig that you can't talk about him without lying. That's, yeah. a, that's what a disgusting pig he was. Go ahead, Sam. I want to reinforce what you're saying. Our pattern of conduct is the Lord Jesus Christ and the revelation of the New Testament. And how do I know? Just to prove what Dave is saying. Guys, write this down. We're not going to have time to read all of this. You can read Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. And Matthew 19, you can read verses 1 to 9. Just read it. Jesus himself said that in the Old Testament period, don't take my word for it. Go read the words of the Lord when our Lord told the religious establishment. One male, one female. He who created them, male and female, at the beginning, said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, so the two shall become one flesh. Therefore they are no longer two but one flesh. And what God brings together, let no man separate. That's the Lord Jesus. Matthew 19, Mark 10. And that's specifically Matthew 19, 4 to 6. But then catch what the Lord says when they say to him, But then why did Moses allow us to divorce? <clears throat> Here's Jesus' own words. The reason why Moses allowed you to divorce, because of the stubbornness of your hearts. But now, it's not so. So here Jesus says, the Old Testament is not our example, because God in his mercy and his love made concessions because of the state and the condition of his people. He made concessions. He allowed them to do things that wasn't his ideal, way of doing things and that he himself hated but now jesus comes and says that was allowed for that period now i'm calling you to a higher standard and i'm going to empower you by the spirit to now elevate you to now live out that standard what was in the old testament is gone you now follow this standard that's jesus so why are you going to the old testament and showing you that mm -hmm.